Yeah. Did it. Okay, that's good. Um, so um, I know a number of you, and uh, I'm delighted to see you all here this morning. I think most of you know that I, uh, my quasi-profession is sitting on boards, <laughs> and uh, I've probably sat on dozens of boards, and uh, currently I'm on the board of the California Endowment of, of the Arcus Foundation of Save the Chimps and of Caravanserai. Um, and I have been on boards that have been disasters, and I've been on boards that have been delights. And I'm going to talk today about how, from a board member's point of view, the right kind of support and structure can not only make great boards, but create great experience is for us, uh, where I think we become much more productive and satisfied board members. So, and a lot of it to start with is talking about best practices around the basic things that we do. Uh, and I'm going to go through quite a bit of material and then Stephanie Miner is going to do a presentation, which is going to be much more fun and lively, I think. <laughs> I hand it to you, Stephanie, to do that. Uh, but there is some very important things that I want to talk about. And I'm going to tell you just a few stories as we go through this. So moving to the next slide. So one of the first things that um, a board needs to do, and I'm speaking to the organization from a board member's point of view, it's extraordinarily important to, first of all, really have a brand that attracts a board member, uh, that makes a board member want to be involved. It's not always just about the cause but the reputation in the city, the other board members who serve, um, you want to be um, build a brand that makes people want to be on your board. And when you get to the point where you have an opening on your board and there's 13 people who want it, and there's six that you want, you're in good business. But then the due diligence starts. And I've often seen boards recruit somebody that they haven't checked out enough and about six months later they're regretting it or board members who join a board and really don't know what's going on and when they find out they're miserable so one of the key uh, issues around due diligence is know who you're recruiting in advance and then do a thorough review of who they are not only in what they bring to the board what they're willing to bring to the board uh, but what you need and are expecting from them. And then they need to know who you are. I always think um, um, you need to always have a very strong packet for a potential new board member that's got your ta 990 taxes, your financials, your policies, your statement of your program, um, articles of incorporation, bylaws, the whole thing. And then the other thing is tell them the truth, good or bad. Uh, and I, I went on one board, they recruited me beautifully. I got on the board, they asked me to serve on the finance committee in the first week, they told me they couldn't make payroll that Friday. <laughs> and I thought, oh, okay, this is going to be a rough ride. Or after I joined one board, the board chair took me aside after I joined the board and they said, so, you know, we've got to fire the CEO and, you know, I want you on that search committee my first meeting and <laughs> I just felt like if you told me before I probably would have been fine but tell me you know t please tell me so the other thing is at the beginning you need to make sure that people understand their clarity of roles and their expectations um, you know from a legal point of view a board is the legal owners a not-for-profit board are the legal owners of the organization not the ceo not the staff the board is the owners i'm on mute and you can't see me my kind of meeting <laughs> so the most important roles and and people should take some time learning about this i'll talk about it in a moment but understanding your fiduciary and fidelity roles and i know seminars that go on for hours just on these two issues but fiduciary means that you're watching the money and you're being prudent about it and fidelity means that you're loyal to the organization and you protect it from risks and dangers 
and you stand up for it, you speak for it. Because if you're an owner, you don't want to go trashing it. And so you want some direction when you get on a board about the fiduciary situation and issues around fidelity. Uh, and that comes in a variety of ways. One is understanding the financials, but also looking at what I call organizational policies about sexual harassment, uh, about discrimination. Um, one thing that we see happening in boards today is not only are you know, CEOs and executive staff getting in trouble for sexual harassment, but board members uh, also get in trouble with volunteers or staff members um, by being inappropriate with them. The other two, in my view, uh, most important job as a board is the hiring, reviewing, and changing of CEOs. And when you going through that, and I, I know some of you on this call are going through that change to a CEO, it's a heck of a lot of work. And it is probably, and you know this, it's maybe the biggest decision you make because that changes everything. So there's some tricks to this. And one is the board needs, and we need ongoing training about how to be a good board member. I know some of you are really, really smart board members. I also know a lot of folks who come on a board and they've never been on a board in their life. And they don't really know what to do and where they're supposed to go. And they kind of wait around to be told. So it's very important, I think, to have ongoing training. And I always uh, send people to board source uh, as a place to get good information, um, good materials you can download. And also from Cal Nonprofits, the association here in California has a lot of great material. Uh, the second thing is the clarity of roles, role, behavior, and commitment. Some organizations I know actually put together job descriptions for board members and a kind of a contract. And some are organized enough to do that and follow through correctly. But I, I think it's better if particularly if you're not working on all cylinders every moment in terms of your board relationship to just get clear about what board roles are. And this issue about role behavior is particularly curious because it's not just about what you're supposed to do, but it's how you're supposed to behave on a board. Uh, and these are kind of the ground rules of how you participate with others in meetings, the way you communicate in the community where you are, that your uh, role you play and the way you treat your relationship with that board and organization is always as an owner who takes ownership responsibility. Um, so you speak well of it, you promote it wherever you go. Uh, and often us board members need to know how to do that best. What, what, are the, what are the stories? What are the narratives we can use? And we also, uh, when a board member comes on, we got to get a, uh, make a commitment uh, and be clear about it so that then we, the organization can go back and say, is this board member really doing what we ask them to do on the board? And then the board member will say, well, I never know you expected that from me. So there's a lot of issues there. I spoke a moment ago about organizational policies and it, it, it's very good for the board to be very keen on some of your policies. And then uh, I, in, in today's world, I wanted to bring this up. We usually don't talk about it and we need to be talking about it. I think today in a world where we're trying to make it, the world a better, more inclusive place. Most of the work we do are designed to do that in many ways. We need a commitment to equity and we need uh, to talk about bringing all the folks that we serve uh, to equal in terms of access to justice and health and education. And I believe that we should do training with our board on equity. And I know that there are three or four of you at least on this call that have committed to this and brought in trainers and are really, tr really, truly trying to be very responsible about learning what that means to an organization in our day-to-day -day work. But I, I think it's ex extraordinarily important and important for the board members. So uh, most of us who sit on boards, our number one activity with a board is board meetings. <laughs> and sometimes I think that's terribly unfortunate because I know that a lot of us have been to board meetings that are miserable. 
um, that just uh, were thinking, this doesn't have anything to do with why I got on the board. And these are the ones where you go and you spend half your time talking about some money problem and then a problem about some staff member. And then the uh, staff talk to us and give us reports and then the meeting is over. And the motions that were made felt like rubber stamping something somebody else already did and thought through. And these, this is a terrific way to make your board disenfranchised and unhappy. Um, so it, it, the, being a, on a board, as I said, is a huge responsibility in that you are an owner in public trust. And you really need to take that ownership and have it. Um, this, is, this is about um, a board meeting set the tone and the brand for the organization for all the folks. And Stephanie's gonna talk more about how board members become ambassadors. If the organization doesn't set the tone, I'll tell you one quick story. Um, when I took over United Cerebral Palsy Worldwide, we had 100 affiliates in the United States, 36,000 employees. We had a huge board. We, they had been through six executive directors in seven years. The, in my recruiting process, I was told that the membership had been meeting with attorneys and wanted to force the board to resign in mass. <laughs> That's how bad it was. And um, so I went through all of the conversations with them and I went ahead and agreed. And on my second day of employment, the board was legally forced to resign. And I had negotiated with the members separately on how we were gonna reorganize the board. And the board meetings had been three and four days long. Materials had not been prepared. Uh, there was arguments. There was no clear leadership. Uh, they met in a basement meeting room in a second rate hotel in Washington, DC. And you could just feel the tension. You could feel the um, uh, angst in the room. So as I put the new board together slowly and carefully, I'd, I went to the, um, it wasn't the Ritz Carlton, but it was probably um, um, even more high end hotel on 16th Street in Washington. And they just remodeled and were about to open. And I went to them. I told them I needed a, to set the tone for my new board. And so they gave me a ballroom at, at this place for next to nothing. And the night before, I had um, one of our board members who is a member of the Metropolitan Club in DC host a dinner at the club, which is a very high end club. And we asked the CEO of United Way of America come and talk to us about philanthropy. Uh, we met with every uh, board committee and made sure that they had done their work, that a report had been filed and a script written for each board member who was chairman and would be reporting. And so the folks came to town instead of staying in a second rate hotel outside of town, we were right by the White House. We were in a gorgeous room, everything was done. They had a very important person talk to them about the importance of their work. And you could see the cultural shift in the organization in one board meeting. And I, I'm, I'm telling you that the way you set the tone creates the seriousness the way people apply themselves and the way they see the organization. It is about presentation and preparation. So also board meetings are serious events and it is very important because partly for legal reasons, but protect liability is to follow your processes and your bylaws. And I know a lot of organizations that do things and later look at their bylaws and said, oh, I don't think we did that right. That's not great. You also need to demonstrate prudent and thoughtful actions. Now, this is like the, the kind of dry stuff we don't usually like to talk about much, but what happens when you do this correctly and people know that we're doing it correctly and documenting it right? Board members respect the process, the role and the organizations much more. It's unnerving for board members to come to a board meeting and see the, the, the process 
be totally out of line with bylaws, that people are making crazy decisions without discussions and nobody's paying attention to the liabilities they create for the organization. It, this is kind of the setting the platform, doing due diligence, um, taking seriously a board meeting and doing it right. These are the kind of building blocks for a good experience. And I talked a little bit about pre preparation for a board member. Boards ought to schedule their meetings a year in advance and clear them with board members. Agendas need to be created by the chair and the CEO, not just the CEO. And I hear this problem all the time. Board members should get packets in advance so they're well prepared. And I, some people overdo it. On the California Endowment, we get a package that's about 250 to 300 pages. And it's miserable. Uh, and you know, you you learn over time what you need to read and what you can read later. The committees need to have met and 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 they're the they they are prepared to report. One thing I've seen organizations do is they'll turn to the chair of some committee and say, Well, did you guys have a meeting? Did y'all get together? Well, come, come on, volunteers that we need staff support. We need staff getting those meetings set up, helping us make sure the agendas follow through, follow through on what was directed at board meetings, and that we don't, one of the worst things that can happen is a board member who chairs the committee to be embarrassed in front of others. You don't let that happen. You, you make sure that we're never embarrassed in front of our peers. And, and then it's about the setting, the support, the packets that take place at the meeting. They need to be well prepared and make us feel like it's an important event. Now, a lot of us who have run board meetings as staff people know it can be a tremendous amount of work. I, I also wanna just talk about transparency and trust. So research tells us that the reason CEOs get fired most of the time is there's a breach of trust. If the board trusts the CEO and the CEO trusts the judgment of the board, the CEO can make lots of mistakes and not get fired. And the board can goof up and, and not take the punishment for it. If there is trust and goodwill, and there's nothing more important than that transparency and trust between board members and key staff and transparency and trust between board members. You do not want small groups of board members making decisions and taking them back to the full board. The board has to be engaged in things. If they think the decisions are being made behind their back and they're not participating, not only does it break down the trust, but it also creates legal liability for an organization like this. So, Let's talk a little bit about what makes a board really a lot more fun. Board meetings, theoretically, if you look at the better models, they take care of their business activities, the finances, the key motions that need to be made, the governance issues in about one third of the meeting. One third of the meeting is training and education, studying your own impact. And a third of the meeting typically on a good board is a generative conversation where board members are able to express themselves. Uh, they get to learn about what's going on. They get to talk about the mission and how you're getting there. Not about the finances, but how do we get to the mission? And so it's a conversation about vision and mission. It's about the stories and building the narrative that the board participates in and learns from. And it's about the connection between the people and the engagement with the organization. And so if you go to a series of board meetings and there's never time for a generative conversation, you've just lost one of the biggest assets that your board members bring. So, and they can be part of the funnest part of a meeting and you can bring in speakers that you can debate with and uh, just have a lot of fun with it. But this is the way to, to teach us board members and for, our board, for us to be listened to a bit and feel like we really are a part of a team. So it's great to be on a great board. 
And the building blocks for taking it, I, I've kind of talked about the, the threshold events that I think need to be done. And then you get to the point where, okay, now, if we do that, how do we have a board that's enthusiastic, excited to be on the board? And the first building block is to build comfort and safety where people can talk honestly and they feel like they're part of a group. Board and staff relations are huge, by the way, and a lot of board, I know a lot of CEOs forbid staff to interact with board members. Uh, I've never taken that stand, but you've got to make sure the staff and the board know the rules of play uh, and the appropriateness of how they interact. But when a board can interact well with the CEO and with certain staff, and the staff feel like they know the board and, the, and, and understand what the board is doing and that they're excited and committed for the organization, a lot of fabulous energy can come from that. Uh, it's also great when board members can play a role where they can feel very successful in being a board member. And, and, and make that clear in their minds. So they're not just sitting at a chair, coming to another meeting, voting on three motions, but they, they have a role to play that makes them feel successful. And, they not, not, and, they, and, and if you can instill a little excitement and joy, I remember one of the things that uh, they did so well with two foundation boards I've been on and, uh, and the endowment I think was a good one, but they, the media, uh, part of the organization, and I understand they have huge resources and stuff that most of us could never afford, but they would have sizzle tapes for the boards and they would have, a, we'd sit down and a video would start and it would show a group of youth leaders that we had funded uh, uh, talking about how they were changing their city and got us excited and joyful about the way we were spending our money and knew that we were having an impact. So, Here's a way of looking at how to be the, uh, how, if you want the best board members ever, this is one way of looking at it. Make them feel this way, that they have a voice or listened to and respected, that they're part of a team, uh, that they have impact on what really happens there. They feel recognized for their accomplishments and they've met, met great people and built relationships and um, their, their culture and their way of thinking is respected and valued, that they're not there as a token. And as a, 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 a gay man, I've been a token on many boards. And one of my goals is to not shy away from that and make people at least understand my culture and respect me. Um, also, I've been on boards that, you know, we get too many lawyers. I hope there's some lawyers here so I can give you crap. Uh, I'm teasing, but uh, there's certain ones of us in our professional lives and just the way we are, we learn and value linear thinking. And so boards love linear thinkers. And I want to say that if you just have people who think that way, you're going to lose a lot of richness. I always think, you know, get people from the arts, please. But you need nonlinear thinkers and they need to be respected. And you need folks who think differently than you do and that can have tolerance for one another so we can learn from each other. We get better outcomes. And when we see board members being treated that way and ourselves being treated that way, we become our best selves. And so when you think through this stuff, th think about how you can get your board members to feel this way about the organization and their experience. So COVID-19 has been a, a, a harsh year. And I think in the first three or four months, we were very worried about survival, uh, our uh, individual and organizationally. And then we felt like we were in a world where we couldn't predict what was going to happen and it didn't feel very good. Uh, and now I think there's a little hope, um, but we lost a lot. And what I saw with boards was often board meetings were much shorter. Uh, staff were talking at the board members. Um, they were trying to get through the information and make sure we knew what was going on. We lost the opportunities to socialize, have that sidebar conversation where we're saying to, uh, hey, Ted, did you understand what he was talking about? Maybe we should go back in there and ask him to clarify that a little bit. 
or just deepening our friendships and relationships that build the kind of trust that boards needs. And we were starting to lose a sense of connectedness, well, to everything, but also to the boards on which we served. And as some people said, we lost dance. Uh, and uh, that's for uh, our folks who run dance programs uh, that we have. Uh, it's been hard on how much the arts really has uh, been impacted and how important the arts are to us. So what can an organization give? Uh, very specifically, they can give more downtime together online when we're at meetings and design it so. Uh, we can be, it is great if we're actually asked to share some of our learning and experiences since COVID began and talk about what we've seen and what we experience and what we're trying to learn about equity and discrimination and how that impacts us differently than it did a year before. Uh, we, we need contact with the leadership where the, I know there's a number of you here who've been in some of our master classes and, and a number of you who've done the task of calling every board meeting and every, every board member and every donor and having a heart to heart talk with them and finding that they care about you immensely and are so willing to help out. And man, you're, you don't lose much in fundraising when you do that because we're actually out here and willing to give back because we care about being on the board. And when we're left out, we don't know what to do. So leverage our commitments and we're ready to be active and make sure that the organizations on whose boards we sit, that we care about are taken care of and you get what you need. We've lost a lot, but we need to get back our heads on track and make things wonderful because we've got a lot of work to do when this is all over. And I wanted to end just with this. I don't need to read it. I just, it's a love letter to staff from board members because we know how hard you worked and we'll never understand how hard it was. So I am done and I appreciate your attention. And Mihai, are you gonna have people take a break? Uh, are no, we gonna keep moving? Uh, yeah, let's move on to uh, Stephanie. And then we can, you know, have questions and call a conversation after uh, um, Stephanie's presentation as well. Okay. Wow. Let me just start off by saying what an excellent presentation, Stephen. It's it's hard being staff because we we have one agenda, and you as board members have another. And so it's really great that you're speaking to this group as a board member. And I'm lucky and grateful that my presentation is going to echo some of those things but from the other side from the staff side so you're you're getting i think good information from two different points of view so hopefully you will find it useful and uh you know implement it so let me share my screen real quick all right hopefully you can see my screen my presentation is going to be about getting your board on board and how to transform your board members into ambassadors for your nonprofit. Now, we assume that a board member who's, who's on our nonprofit joined to be an ambassador, but sometimes that's not easy for all of them. So this presentation is gonna help a little bit with that. So you are in the right place if you want your board to be more engaged and you want your board to help you raise more money. I think every single nonprofit professional wants that. And I think that board members want to be engaged, but there is a big fear about fundraising and who could blame them? Nobody is, is uh, born knowing how to fundraise and it's not easy to ask for money. So we're gonna figure out how to make, make this happen. And if you stay to the end, I'm gonna send you, uh, or you can sign up for two great resources that'll help with this, getting engagement and helping with fundraising. So a lot of the things that I'm talking about are coming from my brand new program called the Board Boost Project Kit. At uh, Center for Nonprofit Advancement, we are all about helping nonprofits go and grow, saving them time, giving them the resources they need to be successful and sustainable. And so when I came on, I, I you know, I'm coming from a I'm coming from a fundraising background. I'm coming from working with nonprofits, but I'm also coming from a marketing background and a business background. And all day long, you can find project kits and courses and e-workshops that give 
businesses resources that they can use kind of plug and play and, and really good direction shortcuts and there's just not a lot of that out there for nonprofits so I'm really working hard to um, build those kind of resources for you all. So my name is Stephanie Miner. I'm the director of the Center for Nonprofit Advancement. And my trainings and resources have been featured in a lot of different places, nationally, locally. I'm in the Palm Desert area and we've been featured in the Desert Sun. Um, I used to work for Martha's Village and Kitchen and I came, which is a homeless shelter in, uh, not a homeless shelter, it's way more than that. It's a homeless service provider that, that helps the impoverished in the community as well. And I came to CNA through uh, a contest that I did speaking about Martha's Village and Kitchen. It's called the Desert Fast Pitch. So if any of you are uh, offering services in the fourth district, email me after this because you have a chance to win $22,000, $10,000, $15,000. And it's kind of like a Shark Tank uh, event for nonprofits. So that is how I came to CNA. My goal for you is to get to the point where the whole board is talking in a good way about your nonprofit, telling everybody that will listen to them um, how great it is and sharing that information in a way that makes the best sense for them. Not necessarily the way we want them to do it, but what we need to meet them where they are at, figure out the best way to move forward and then get them going in a positive direction. So are you ready to get your board on board? Let's do it. The first strategy is evaluation. And that means take a look at who's on your board right now. You know, are they, Stephen said something about a bunch of, you may have a bunch of lawyers on your board or a bunch of bankers, whoever it is. It doesn't matter who's on there. You need to take an assessment, literally take the time. And I know this is the hardest thing I'm going to say to you today. Take the time to sit down and focus on this and come up with a plan. Follow these four steps. Follow some of the things that Stephen talked about. That's the only way that change is going to happen, or that's the only way that you're going to set yourself up for success. So the first thing to do is evaluate how engaged your current board members are, and then ask yourself, what are their skills? Make an assessment of this. Find out which ones on your board are willing to help you with fundraising. They might not even know it yet, but you just ask them questions about communicating and what they feel comfortable with and those type of things, and then we're going to set them up for success. So some of the questions, again, to ask yourself, do they have people skills? Are they talk comfortable talking to others? Would they maybe rather write thank you notes or analyze your donor data, something else? We need to tap in to what they love and what they're good at so that they can help us move the needle, raise more money and become more engaged with our nonprofits. So again, board members can help you make, make a difference and raise funds, even if they're not willing to make that direct ask. So it's up to us to find out how to, how to best fit them into what we need. And again, this is just a little reminder. I know that sitting down, like taking time away from the craziness of your day seems impossible, but you need to have protected time on your calendar. Go to Starbucks now that we can be out in person. Go somewhere where you're not disturbed and really maybe take an extra member of staff so you guys can discuss it and take that assessment, evaluate your board so you know where you're at. And then the next strategy is to inspire your board. That is one of the biggest parts of your job. Your board are full of people who cared enough to join the organization, but maybe they've, they've been on there a long time, they're feeling stagnant, maybe they got tricked like Stephen did, maybe they're in a bad situation in their own life. It doesn't matter because it's up to us to make sure that no matter where they are, they are inspired and that they have the resources to, uh, to be inspired. And one of the best ways to do that is sharing stories with your board. At every board meeting, email them, you know, um, send them messages, pick up the phone and, and tell them about it. Share videos, Stephen talked about that, those sizzle reels. And I'm gonna tell you right now, your board does not care if the videos are high value production or if they were shot on your cell phone. The, if they can see, for example, at Martha's Village and Kitchen, a video of the kids in the Children's Services Center still doing art and learning and reading with masks on and what that looks like for them for their day, that's touching. They're going to share that story. If they can see a senior citizen being um, handed bags of, of food and walking out the door with the help of, of staff, that's going to reconnect them to their mission and it does not need to be fancy. It could be just simple videos and then share resources that they can post on social media. Take the time to make a 
you know, 10 resource to 10, um, I'm sorry, social media templates that they can share and either put them in a shared file or email them to the board once, once a month and make sure that there's a lot of variety to those social media posts, calls for volunteering, act donating items, telling why they're on the board, make it easy, give them the tools. And I have a really good toolkit, two toolkits actually about that for you. So again, whenever we're talking about trying to make the board be part of who we are and what we're doing. And this is one of the biggest, most important parts of our job, because again, the board owns the nonprofit, not you, not the CEO, not the staff, the board. So we need to get them engaged. And every time we ask them to do something, we need to think, is this easy or is this hard? And then figure out a way to make it easy for them. Uh, the next strategy is invitation. Invite all of your board members to help personally. You know, sometimes we look at the board as just kind of like a herd of people and they're not, they're individuals. And so it's important to take time. And if, if you're the, the uh, CEO and you don't have time, have the director of development, have somebody on the team, personally speak to a board member on the phone, over Zoom, in person, and uh, invite them to be part of what you're doing and match them with their skill set. Meet them where they are. This sets them up for success. If I am a shy person and I don't want to go up to one of my friends and ask for money, and that's what you're at, oh, that's my only option, I'm not gonna do it. I'm not gonna be successful. I'm gonna be stressed out. But if you know that I'm shy and you know that I love data, then maybe you give me a list of donors and I can do some analysis and figure out you know, who we can maybe move to the next level. Or maybe I'll, I'm willing to write thank you notes. Whatever your, your um, board member skill set is, match them with that so that they can have success. Because once they're successful once, they want that feeling again and again and again. And that helps your nonprofit move the needle. And when you ask them to do something that matches their skill set, they will say yes. The fourth strategy is to give them support and encouragement. So every single step of the way, every single thing that you're asking them to do and participate in, you have to support them. They are volunteers. Like Steven said, I mean, even getting them together for committee meetings, you can't expect them to handle that on their own. You've got to support them, you've got to encourage them, and you'll get better engagement. And it can just be simple things. I'm not, I'm not saying to do anything hard, just simple acts of picking up the phone, calendar reminders, those types of things. And then I think one of the most important things that you can do besides all that I said is give them the tools for success. I don't expect Mihai to post about, you know, Martha's Village and Kitchen and go find pictures of, of homeless kids and figure out what to say. And, and he's not going to do that. He doesn't have time. But if I say, hey, Mihai, here's 10 templates that you can use and some captions. Could you post once a week? Could you tag your friends? Could you like our page and our posts and page? And can you share that? And I'm making it easy for him. He'll probably do it. And make sure that you celebrate the wins. If somebody on your board takes the time to make a phone call and somebody turns around and donates after that, then you've got to celebrate that win by thanking them, by sending them a note, by whatever means necessary. If they, you know, even if somebody is, a lot of uh, boards here in the desert have older people on them. So it is a big win to get any of them to post something on, on social media. And when you notice that, you need to celebrate with, that, with them and let everyone else on the board know what they're doing. So I've talked about four really important things. And I know that this is how most of us look every single day with our shirts halfway out and our long, long list, but it is so worth it. Nothing can, can happen until you take the time to do these things. And it all begins with kind of evaluating the board and where they're at. So what do you think? Can you do it? Can you not do it? Maybe the answer is whether you think you can or you think you can't, you are right. So we have got to figure out a way to make sure that you can do this because it makes all the difference. Your board and their engagement is so important. So in the chat, Mihai is going to give you the link to sign up for a, re, a free resource that will give you three tactics to transform any board member into a fundraiser. Um, it has lots of different tools and, and uh, some really good information in there. It's an ebook that you can download and read on your phone, on your laptop, and you can print it out. It's got nice, nice graphics. So definitely sign up for that. And then I created, like I said at the beginning of this, a program called the Board Boost Kit. And it is normally a $57 product, but I have a $30 coupon code for you all. So it'll go down to $27. 
um, if it's something that you're interested in. And that goes through how to create this particular project kit mostly focuses on social media. There will be other board boost projects kits that say like board boost, pro bo board boost, try to say that five times fast, <laughs> board boost project kit for strategic planning, for board leadership, for you know, social media. There'll be all kinds of kits that are coming out and this is our first one. So this is a tool for, for nonprofit professionals to set up your board for success for social media. You get you get a bunch of information on how to give your board basic social media training, and you can actually just give them the primer and they can watch some of the videos inside of the kit. You can give them the login information. Your nonprofit can buy it once and everybody in the organization can share the login. And then we give you information to give them some more advanced training. And then we also have some done for you social media kits. Again, all those things that I was talking about, the templates that you can share with them, um, including graphics, including words that they can say where all they, you know, these are pre-written templates where they can just put the name of your nonprofit in post and go. And then we've got um, social media post worksheets, checklists, um, everything that you need, hashtags that are really good for nonprofits, all of the things that will help you be successful as a staff member, and then also give your board some amazing tools that make their job easier. So the coupon code is boost now, all capital letters. If you're interested in this at all, I'm not here just to sell you this, but I do have this kit and I'm, I'm hoping that you see the value in it and you might want to use it. But if not, that's fine. I'm, I just want you to know that this, this resource is available. And again, this is all that you get in the kit and so much more. And we are always adding bonus materials to the kit. So that's it for me. Yay.